Now it's time for the healthcare interoperability after party with Mario Highland and Richard Etima from Aegis.net. We had a few questions submitted. Uh, there's also, you know, I have a question for you at HIMSS that uh, I want to do as well, but uh, let's see. I, I don't know how to pronounce this name, but you, Lena Smith? Uh, she said, are you familiar with ASTM standards? Full disclosure, I work for ASTM. Do you guys know uh, ASTM? I don't know. What uh, could somebody, uh, what is ASTM? Yeah, you know, she was on her lunch break, she said. So, uh, International Standards Organization that develops and publishes voluntary consensus technical standards for a wide range of materials, products, systems, and services. More than 13,000 plus ASTM standards. Excellent. Whoa. Well, we were wondering if we'd have anything to do tomorrow. <laughs> you, you guys will have a bit of more. <laughs> so it sounds like it's a standards creating organization, maybe like HL7, but maybe applied more broadly across other industries. So yeah. So it sounds like you're not familiar, but. Uh, we're not currently working in that space, but would love an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think Jimmy's question was interesting. Uh, do you work with the end users, doc patients, and work backwards? Because if UI is not intuitive, what is the point? You know, you kind of address that in the other chat, but I think there's an interesting point from a UI perspective, from the vendor perspective, right? How have you focused on making testing usable for the vendors that want to be able to do continuous testing? So... I, I want to answer that question a slightly different way. I want to use the last Connectathon that we had in Orlando. One of the folks that was, was running a track was a guy by the name of Gill out of Harvard Genomics. And so as an example, here's somebody in the industry is leading the genomics effort to ensure the standards are written in a way that will be interoperable. And he immediately recognized that testing was a key way to ensure that everyone was implementing them the same way, the same way. So it doesn't matter what the test is, the test should be right. But the goal of getting everyone to test the same way from his perspective would ensure interoperability. So he is a PhD, he's a professor running the genomics initiative mm -hmm. and he's leveraging fire because it's simpler and it's quick to implement and it's a way to get the genomics community together and potentially be solving some of the presidential's mandate around precision health care so genomics is a is a key factor in that so you know i expect to and i, I look forward to talking with people like baylor and others that are in the genomics space to see what they're doing to be part of the of the presidential mandate around precision medicine. Um, when we start looking at population health, um, those the ability to collect data and be able to look at outcomes analysis and decision support across vast amounts of data while ensuring PHI and PII is protected, I believe FIRE is uniquely position to be able to support those initiatives. And while everyone would deem and considers FIRE to be draft, a DSTU, a DSTU2, like the current version, really I think, and you'll hear more of this at HIMS, HL7 FIRE is beyond draft. And now the resources themselves are maturing and there will be new resources at different maturity levels. So I'll pause there. No, uh, speaking of more work for you, genomics seems like a whole other world. I mean, if we can't even share prescriptions and uh, chief complaint lists, now we're talking about sharing genomic uh, g genome sequences and genomic markers. And let's not forget about the biome. <laughs> like, uh, I actually hosted a panel at CES with uh, uh, Inova uh, uh, Translational Medicine, uh, an expert there that does genomic medicine, and they're doing uh, triads of the, the baby, the mom, and the dad. And so they have genomic sequences across all three. And now imagine we got to share that between some. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. A whole other world of testing just waiting for you to, to do work, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, we still a, have pocket 
Yeah, at the Connectathon, I actually worked with Gil quite closely because he was the track lead for the Fire Genomics track. Uh, so uh, that was a lot of fun for me. Uh, I was invited over to the genomics table at the Connectathon and provided them with a demonstration of Touchstone and the initial test scripts that we had written for the new sequence resource that's in uh, going to be in the in the new 3.0 uh, DSTU2. Although I think they dropped the D now. It's now just called a standard for trial use. Uh, so uh, although I, I still see DSTU used all over the place, but it's really a working standard, and that's the, that's the term that you're going to be hearing a lot, is no longer draft, but a working standard. Nice. Well, it's kind of like, what's an EMR or an EHR? Uh, the doctors say, well, I use an EMR, but <laughs> yeah, as long as yeah. we know what we're saying, that's what matters. Yeah, uh, Roxanne actually brought up the uh, question during our conversation as well, uh, and she brought up some, you know, watches doing detecting seizures, which I would expand that to the whole wearables market and Internet mm -hmm. of Things marketplace, which is monitoring our health. I mean, whether it's on our body or whether it's monitoring our environment. Uh, have you done any work in that area? It seems like that would be fraught with the same challenges, no? So, yeah, the um, I. <laughs> The, the Internet of Things is definitely um, an exploding area. Um, there's opportunities for people to develop and work on standards. Um, I point back to uh, an initiative, the Data Palooza. It's an event where we showcase every year a number of very inventive vendors that show some really cool things. But it, what I would like to do is when I go to that event, Talk to those organizations about how interoperable their data is. You talked about wearable devices like Fitbit. Mm -hmm. If I could go to Fitbit and I could say, can I generate an HL7 V2 feed to an EHR vendor? If I can't, then the industry should go to Fitbit and say, this is what we want. We don't want our data proprietarily mm -hmm. kept in any wearable devices solution or portal. We want to make sure that it is following industry standards and all of these internet of things that are being connected should lead with trying to form a consensus based approaches and write standards so that when we invest in these wearable devices and they're collecting our uh, information that we can choose where we want to send that information, and it is in an EHR industry healthcare format that everybody can consume. And mm. those are challenges we need to, as a population, make onto the vendors that we're buying these solutions from. It's interesting you say that because uh, you know I've recently written in, in, in an article which uh, I described why don't doctors care about Fitbit data. And my answer was, well, because Fitbit data is not clinically relevant, uh, at least not yet, right? I think they're starting to get closer to that. And, and, and many devices are becoming more and more clinically relevant. Uh, and so that's why doctors aren't reaching out to Fitbit and saying, I want your data. <laughs> Patients are sometimes saying, why don't you take my data? Correct. It's saying, should we mm -hmm. take it with you, right? Or whoever those, you know. And so, but I think, you know, that's interesting. Maybe we need to create a framework for vendors and doctors and you know health IT leaders to know how should they ask for this device data because, like you said, they don't understand standards. They don't understand the standards-based approach. Most of them, uh, you know, there maybe you know one or two. You know, if you're Cerner, you have five or ten, right? You know, like. Uh, you know, that understand standards, the rest are like, I don't really know. Can't, haven't you just figured this out? You know, so it almost seems like we need to offer best practices so that as all of this new data starts being developed, uh, then you can ask for it in a standards-based way rather than asking for it and then the developer just throws something together, right? Uh, which I think is what's happened so far. So it is conceivable right now in today's less than totally interoperable world. We're not totally interoperable today. But it mm -hmm. is conceivable that you could send a consolidated CDA for somebody who has multiple events and multiple clinical issues 
that is a couple of gigabytes of data. No vendor, no vendor can develop an EHR that will allow a provider to have more time. That information is starting to become too immense. And as we go forward, there is no question in anyone's mind that the data associated with a John Lynn or a Mario will go beyond where it is today. Within an average EHR hospital, Johns Hopkins in California, one of their implementations out there is in the early stages. They had in one day almost 2 million events recorded in their EHR. These are things that are, might be actionable, things where people have to look for drug interactions or pharmacy running low on a particular prescription, that sort of thing. No one can read 2 million alerts a day. Um, some of the lead doctors at that implementation wrote a book and they went and did a survey with Boeing and they asked Boeing engineers, how do you convey critical information to a pilot? And Boeing's engineer, chief of engineers said, what's critical? Airplane fall out of sky was their definition of when in the most serious situation, a pilot needs to be told of something. And they were like, well, what would not be considered emergency? An engine catching fire is a routine event. There's no reason to alarm the pilot, not the passengers. There's no reason to alarm the pilot. Engine on fire. No, we can handle that. So if you can take an airplane that is mission critical while it's in the air and have an engine fire not alert anyone because it's handling it, then our EHR systems have to recognize what level of alerts and what level of information is critical to that provider as they're trying to provide care. And right now, we're just trying to get the data together. We haven't even got to that part yet. So we need to get the data. It needs to be reliable. Nobody is talking at all about the quality of data. We're bringing interoperable data from five and 10 years ago together in a modern EHR system, we're learning today that we still don't have the understanding of the vocabularies and terminology. We know that because we're still trying to get it right. So if we're still trying to get it right, well, what about the data that's five and six years old? We're trying to shove that into an EHR saying all that data is high quality. The, the providers don't have the confidence in that data to use it in a clinical setting to make clinical decisions or recommendations off of. And, and, and nobody is considering recognizing that the quality of that data might be a concern in a clinical setting. And I think they should. Yeah. I just wrote a blog post for Iron Mountain called The Risk and Rewards of, of Healthcare Quality Data and Healthcare Data Integrity. Uh, you know, because I think there are, there's risks associated that the data is going to be wrong and you're going to do some sort of outcome. And that's true, whether it's internal system, whether it's interoperability, whether it's duplicate patients, right? <laughs> like yes. the quality and, you know, the quality and integrity of that data, but also there's lots of rewards that are sitting there waiting for organizations that invest in ensuring that that data is quality because their future reimbursement is going to depend on how, how, how much quality there is in their data that they can then leverage to improve healthcare. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. More than, I believe this is a, this is a number that's researchable. More than 70% of everyone claimed to be allergic to penicillin probably doesn't realize they're not allergic to penicillin, but it historically it got written in their record at one point or somebody told them or their mother told them or something. And they may not be. Very few people can change their clinical medical record historically to remove that. It's very difficult. Yeah, I actually linked to an article where a doctor once told me, he said, my problem with EMR is that it perpetuates misinformation. But, yeah, so if you document something, mm -hmm. correctly, then that stays there forever and it's hard to correct. So I think that's a great thing. So I want to finish. I know we're over time, but hopefully you have a, if you have a couple more minutes, I'm yep. interested to know. Uh, you know, Hims is around the corner. I've been to the interoperability showcase for the last what five years or something. I've seen that they can be interoperable, right? 
Mm -hmm. If Mario and Richard were going around to all these uh, vendors, right, that say we're interoperable, right? I mean, that's kind of the message you get when you go there. And you're like, well, you know, and they, they often will show you, look, this is a server and this is a Meditech and look, I just transferred it, right? You know, and you're like, okay. Mm -hmm. And then my question has always been, well, okay, why isn't that happening between this hospital and this hospital, which has those two systems? And they're always like, well, you know, there's, oh, you know, they, they, they hedge you know, around it. So what would Richard and Mario ask these vendors? You know, what would be your survey of these vendors to say, tell me what's really happening? What, what questions would you ask? So if I were outside of the interoperability showcase and approaching the vendors booths and they were talking about interoperability, what I would ask them is what demonstration can they make of what their quality, assertion, quality assurance and their testing is? I would want to learn how they support quality assurance and how they support testing. And if I was investing in any EHR as a CIO, I would look to the implementation of that EHR and the quality process that they use to test the implementation. And that by virtue of how they operate will show me whether or not I can manage my risk or whether I have an elevated risk. And until I get a clear understanding and only through that implementation effort will I truly know the level of risk that they're pushing to me as a consumer because of the level of testing. When I go to the interoperability showcase, it is that. It is a showcase. It is not an environment where you can really test the rigors of an implementation or see something that you believe will be replicated in your environment. It's there to show you the best case. The best case, this is what it will look like and act like and do. It's coming full circle. Scale, yeah. Scalable interoperability that Gartner talked about. Anything you'd add, Richard? Mm -hmm. Well, I've actually participated in the interoperability showcase on a number of occasions. Uh, so from the inside looking out, realizing how the vendors are getting there and what they're doing in this showcase, uh, you can see that the scenarios that are put together for the showcase, they start at the IHE Connectathon. And you know, so you've got like a month, two months maybe after the IHE Connectathon to work with those within your use case uh, to figure out how you're gonna make this work. And so I'm like, okay, it's gonna take me two months to work with maybe three, four vendors to get something that I can demonstrate at a showcase. So I'm thinking this should be a no-brainer, right? You went to the IG Connectathon, you passed, you know, these profiles. We should just hook each other up, you know, say, here, send me a document, I'll parse it, you know, I'll, I'll exchange using these profiles. We're good, right? But a lot of what's going on is they support the profiles, they support the exchange, they passed all the testing that they went through, but there's a lot of content uh, that may not be interoperable. So I may have a CDA document that I'm sending across the wire, but you know the exchange happens, but now I have to process the, the internals of that document. And so now we have to get the semantics correct, we have to get the data content correct, uh, you know, so that we can exchange and understand what it, everybody's talking about. So it's uh, it, it's an interesting dance at the interoperability showcase. Uh, it's fun to see all of the use cases that are there and that are working, that are functional. But it's uh, it, it's definitely one, once you've been involved with it and understand what's going on, the questions you're going to start to ask is, well, why did it take me so long? to actually ensure that I could exchange with another uh, vendor, you know. So uh, I would probably go to the vendor booths at HIMSS and say, I see you're in the interoperability showcase. You know, what were the challenges that you ran into in getting your showcase use case to work? You know, who are you working with? You know, I, I want to find out, uh, you know, what, what went on behind the scenes to make sure that everything was truly 
interoperable within that use case. Yeah, that, that's actually some great advice. Like, okay, you got there, but what did it take? So then how can I replicate that, right? Which is the next question. Well, or, or make it better, right? I mean, yeah. you know, improve, improve upon that. Yeah, if you, if you have another minute, John, let me give you a case study. Last year, inside the Interoperability Showcase, there was a use case for family planning. And it was a Saturday, um, early morning, uh, probably around 11 a.m., um, one of the vice presidents from a major EHR vendor was walking through the showcase. He was sh specifically there to visit which booths, which showcases were going to showcase their EHR. And he noted something unusual with the family planning use case. Everybody was done. Everybody was sitting there talking about water skiing and other activities on a Saturday morning when everyone was just trying to get their use cases to work. Hmm. And he, he came up to our booth. He wanted to know why was this showcase different? And we said, everybody test it. We tested this use case before we came to the showcase. We had done all of this from our local habitats, wherever we were. And when we actually came together, everything worked. We were done. They asked us to stay because it was going to be impolite to the other use cases because ours worked and they were having challenges. <laughs> so we had to talk about water skiing. Um, we believe testing is an important part of interoperability. When you're talking interoperability, you have to be talking about testing. Aegis would have loved to have been in the HIMSS interoperability showcase this year talking about testing, talking about certification. But HIMS did not want us to be there. So we'll be talking about it from our booth. Um, they did offer us a chance to be in the innovation in the innovation um, kiosk. But we think that what we're doing is beyond innovation. And we do believe it's linked directly to testing. So if I were walking into any of those EHR vendor booths at HIMS and they said, hey, we're doing fire. I would want anyone listening to this to ask them, how are you testing fire? And when they offered an answer that did not include touchstone, I would ask them why they're not testing where the industry is testing. The developers integration lab has over 380 organizations registered today, more than 33,000 test executions per month on average are being done within the developers integration lab. Touchstone with Fire has more than 40 organizations registered today with more than 45 systems um, configured to do testing. With more than 600 test executions, thousands of test cases, tens of thousands of test assertions being executed against all of those fire messages in literally a few short months. This demonstrates how people are advancing towards test-driven development. We believe that this is going to be a precursor to why FIRE is going to be so successful. Well, uh, you know, uh, we've had many conversations together about testing, and uh, I, I, over that time, I've definitely come to understand the key to testing. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it is important that uh, it be done properly, it be done across multiple institutions, and anyone that's had to build an interface or some sort of exchange of information between two EHR vendors should know that very, very clearly that EHR vendors on their own interpreting a standard is not going to work. And, uh, you know, so there needs to be some sort of third party verification that every vendor does or it just doesn't work well. Agreed. And you'll hear, you will hear a lot of people talk about, well, the testing tool needs to be open source. We want open source testing. Well, the problem with this is that we can't approach testing from a box tool perspective. Creating a box tool that you download and test in your environment does one thing. It tests in isolation the actual conformity of a single message. It does not test interoperability. It does not test the contextual awareness 
the fabric of what an EHR system is in true interoperability. We need integrated ecosystems. So testing platforms have to support interactive <coughs> integrated ecosystems in order to push the rigors of these systems so that all EHR, benef EHR vendors can benefit from that rigorous testing. And that can only be done by cloud-based platforms. And unfortunately, that's not an open source solution. It, it can be open access, but not exactly. open source. I think that's the key, right? I mean, to me, open source is a question of business model and, and, and who's developing it and different things. But I think the, the testing procedures and, and those things need to be open so that the community can provide feedback and that there's an open feedback loop of how it's being improved and the decisions that were made, right? I mean, it's yes. that part yes. needs that that, that's exactly what we're promoting with uh, the test script resource. So if you can have a common uh, definition of what a test is, and you can give the power to uh, you know the industry to say this is how we're defining a test, we'll run the test, but you are free to define it, put in whatever rules you want, uh, you know, and we can define peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know. Complex workflows, you know, the test definition via the test script uh, is built to handle a lot of the, the features that you're going to need. And we're looking to continually improve upon that definition. Uh, one of the great things about FHIR that I did want to mention is that the specification itself allows and uh, for native extensibility of the resources. So uh, if we find something within the test script that we need to do above and beyond the current definition, we're not constrained by waiting for you know a balloting process could take weeks or months for the next version to come out before we can implement something. So if we find features that we want to incorporate into the definition, we can make our own extensions and then ballot those back to the standards body to incorporate in the next version. But we're not constrained upon waiting uh, to implement those things as well. And we want to encourage anyone out there who's running a certification program or a testing program that those tools and those processes should be open and everybody should see how we're testing systems and we should be able to run those tests anytime, anywhere. So, and that's what we're going to talk about at HIMSS. Nice. Well, uh, you know, that, that's a great uh, finish for me because uh, I, I have at least one and maybe two uh, pre hymns blabs that I'm doing later this week. So if you want to follow those, you can check them out at blab.im slash EHR and HIT. I'll schedule them out. But I want to wrap this up now and uh, thank our guests today. We had Mario Highland, Senior VP and Founder at Aegis.net, and Richard Edema, Senior Lead Developer at Aegis.net. Thanks so much, guys, for joining me. And if, if you guys like the content here, check out more healthcare IT content at healthcarescene.com. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Look forward to seeing everybody at Yep, definitely. We'll be demoing Touchstone and talking fire.